Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I am back for this month's Coffee and Questions where I answer your questions from YouTube comments. So make sure you comment down below with all of your questions so I can pick them up for next month and then an Instagram poll. This month, I am going to be talking about anemia during pregnancy. I'm gonna talk about milk supply between babies. I'm gonna talk about IUDs while breastfeeding. This is a really random week. I'm gonna talk about having your placenta scooped out from inside your uterus and what that means and looks like. Having your water broken. Wearing tight underwear and if that affects you, using a birth ball, hypertonic pelvic floors, and a whole lot of other things. So make sure you keep watching, hit that little subscribe button, and then let's get answering your questions. Let's start with YouTube. Per usual, although it's not necessarily per usual because sometimes I start with Instagram, but today we're starting with YouTube. This comes from my five tips you need to know for postpartum for both mom and baby. Lisa Harwood, Harewood says, is the fundal massage internal or external? This is like a great clarification to make. I wasn't clear on this, thanks. I apologize that it wasn't clear. Moral of the story is the fundal exam or the check of the uterus is external. No one should be reaching in to feel your fundus from the inside. That would be rather torturous. If you imagine this being your uterus, we don't want your uterus boggy, we call it, like smushy. We want it firm like a softball. And so we really want it like almost going back to this size as well. So we want it to feel firm. What we would do is, if your uterus was really this big, which it shouldn't be this big, let's go with this big. It's down here in your in your belly and we're gonna rub on the outside so it would look like this. And you go for a couple of seconds and that's it. Brenda from my sleep tips for new parents with your baby says, what are your tips for surviving the newborn stage for someone with zero support people to ask for help? Just mom and baby. I love this question. I hope that there were little snippets throughout that video. If you haven't seen that video, make sure you do. One of my tips would be wear your baby. That also frees up your hands to do other things. And then your baby stays nice and close. They're bonding with you. They actually sleep very well when you're wearing them. So that's a huge tip. And then as far as specific to sleep, I would say that keep your baby close to you, that across the room is just way too much work for you, that if you have a co-sleeper or like a little bassinet that can come or even just like a box next to the bed or something protecting the baby from not sleeping with your baby, that your baby is close enough that in the nighttime when they wake up, you just grab, you latch, you make sure you're nice and tucked in with pillows around you, put baby back down, and then throughout the daytime, same rules apply. And then during the daytime, the same rules apply that when they go down to sleep, you put the baby down like right next to you so you can potentially wake up and then go to, go to take your nap, wake up when they wake up. Another thing would be just having meals prepared ahead of time, maybe ordering in or doing really easy, nutritious meals that you can kind of grab and go on your own. And then really my last tip would be that if you're like more of a type A person that you like everything perfect, let all of that go, that you have to sort of prioritize your needs and then the baby's needs. And really I would say your needs first within reason, obviously like your baby needs to eat and survive, but otherwise that the, the dishes can wait, the laundry can wait, throw in a load. If it sits a little longer being wet, it's gonna be okay. Give yourself so much grace that you're doing the best you can and your needs actually do matter. This comes from my delayed cord clamping video. So this is an older video, but this is a super important video for this day and age because you probably will come up against this in your hospital, not against it, but like you'll, you'll have this to consider while you give birth, which Karina Lemus says, is delayed cord clamping recommended with gestational diabetes? The answer is yes, gestational diabetes doesn't rule you out for delayed cord clamping. Really the only true contraindication to Delayed cord clamping would be if they needed to work on the baby, like there was some sort of complication where the NICU team needed them disconnected from the cord right away. Um, but gestational diabetes is not a contraindication. There are really no circumstances that I can think of off the top of my head other than maybe some really, really unusual ones that I'm unaware of that would rule you out for not being able to do delayed cord clamping. 
Oh, I love this one. All right, Heather Carroll says, this is from my three breathing techniques for labor, birth, and life. How to feel in control and cope. She says, hi, any suggestions for someone who can't really breathe through the nose due to a deviated septum? And unfortunately, I have anxiety, which doesn't help. I'm 40 weeks today and trying to avoid an induction. She wants to use these techniques. So honestly, one of the things I say is in through the nose, out through the mouth, because in through the nose when you're breathing for labor, kind of helps slow down your breath rather than because when you open your mouth like that, you just get in so much air all at one moment. And so instead I would say to potentially purse your lips a little bit. Now, mind you, I will also say that like, you can also just breathe through your mouth. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people prefer that, especially if like, maybe you breathe for sports or something and that's sort of more your routine. But if you find that maybe you're hyperventilating or you're feeling like you're breathing too fast, you get lightheaded, purse your lips. That'll help help control the breath so you're not taking in like <gasps> gasps of air. The other thing is just be mindful. Slow down the rate a little bit. You may, with the in through the nose, it's more of an in, two, three. Whereas with the mouth, you might wanna go in, two, three because you're taking in so much more volume. Couple little tips, but either way, you can totally just breathe through your mouth if you're having an issue with breathing through your nose. Elizabeth Snow, this comes from the How to Engage Your Baby video. She says, I love all your videos. They've been helping so much. I have a question. Do belly support bands or tighter underwear affect the process of the baby dropping? My underwear are getting so snug on me and when I sit down, they get tighter underneath my belly. Super good question. So in theory, they could, in theory, very loosely, but you have to think about, you have layers of protection before you get to the uterus and then to the baby trying to navigate through the pelvis. So super duper unlikely. And in fact, in labor, one of the ways we help engage the baby is by helping them with some extra support on the bottom part to kind of tip them into the uterus or into the pelvis. One of the other ways that we can, we can in pregnancy is actually help support the lower part of the uterus to help sort of tip the baby into the pelvis, which the opening of the pelvis, which sits backwards in the, in the, in your like pelvic area. So I would say in general, unless they're like suffocating you and you have like a line left over or something that unlikely your underwear or a support belt is ever going to impede the baby. If not, especially the support belts can help to encourage the baby into the pelvis, which we love and also support your round ligament support your back pain and help you feel more comfortable through your pregnancy. So go for it. Elise Ireland, this comes from my How to Engage the Baby video. She also says, would a birth ball be good for someone with a hypertonic pelvic floor dysfunction? I'm 25 weeks as well, or maybe just in general. Absolutely, and I'm no pelvic floor therapist, so make sure you're seeing your pelvic floor therapist. But I would say a hypertonic pelvic floor would mean you have a lot of tension in the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is just the muscles, the group of muscles in your pelvic area that helps support your organs. And so with that, if they're hypertonic, we're thinking they're super uptight in there that they're holding on and we need them to relax. And when you sit on the birth ball, that not only helps the weight of the pregnancy help to push against the ball, but also helps open your hips. And then you do some breathing with that. That can be super helpful for your pelvic floor and helping to relax the pelvic floor. If you haven't seen my breathing tips for labor video, make sure you check that one out because there's a, the third type of breath there is really good for also hypertonic pelvic floors as an added bonus resource for you. All right, let's go over to Instagram and look at the poll from Instagram and answer some of your questions from there. Slussember says, do natural redheads have a higher risk of hemorrhage or is that a myth? <laughs> there actually is a slight correlation with hemorrhage, meaning bleeding too much after birth and being a natural redhead. For some reason, it puts you at higher risk. So especially if you dye your hair, this might be something that you mention to your OB, to your nurse when you come in, hey, FYI, I have natural red hair. They're gonna go, cool, noted, I'm paying attention to the fact that you're at risk. Maybe it's small, slightly higher risk for bleeding, but otherwise, in general, I wouldn't stress about it. It's not like one of those things that's like, oh yeah, you're definitely going to bleed. Kwayambo says, how do I prevent having my placenta scooped out in my next birth? Super interesting. So we actually just finished filming hemorrhage today. I taught a class for nurses on hemorrhage and we talk about what's called a manual removal of the placenta. 
The goal after birth is that the placenta entirely comes out of your uterus. We don't need a placenta anymore. It did its job. Thank you very much. Now it's time to leave because if any remnants are left inside, that being the placenta, or it could actually be some of the amniotic sac, which is like this thin, slimy membrane that can be left inside, that can cause issues. Issues meaning infection, it could cause added bleeding, or it could even affect your breastfeeding. And so sometimes at birth, if the whole placenta doesn't come out, sometimes it is possible that the provider actually has to reach inside and feel along the inside of the uterus and kind of like scoop it out so that the entire placenta comes. Not ideal, not very comfortable. Hopefully you have an epidural or at least some anesthesia on board because it can be pretty uncomfortable. And so if this is something you're trying to avoid, I would want you to have a discussion with your provider that was there and say, hey, what happened? Why was that necessary? Is that a higher risk this time around for that to happen again? And then make it clear that if we can avoid that, I would like to avoid that. Now, obviously, as far as like what you can do ahead of time, if there's a chunk of your placenta that's left inside, there really isn't much that you can do to control that. It would just be walking in with super clear expectations, a super clear conversation that you've had with your provider ahead of time to know that that's not your goal. And then also understanding that in the case of there either being placenta left inside and risking it or doing that sweep and being done and not having any of the potential complications, you really can't have any leftover placenta. It's not good. It can cause issues into the future and like actually make you really sick. And so best case scenario is it just comes out all together on its own. Say a little prayer, have that discussion with your provider and then flex and flow based on what happens. Britt Hutch 12 says, when is it okay to having my water broken? So my assumption is that saying okay to your provider that yes, you can break my water. So if you haven't taken my childbirth classes specific to the medical interventions class, make sure you take a class because those childbirth classes are gonna help set you up to know what's going on and be able to navigate a lot of these conversations. Now, mind you, with your water being broken, my super simple answer to this question when she says, when is it okay to have your water broken? And I would say, when you feel like it's okay with you. Because <laughs> there may be some people that are like, absolutely not. That's not a preference of mine. I'm not interested. And other people that are like, whatever, I don't care. Like, you do whatever you want. And then there's likely a good amount of people that are somewhere in between with the goal being that you understand what's the purpose in that circumstance. And sometimes getting your water broken instead of letting and waiting for it to break on its own could potentially lead to avoiding a C-section maybe. If it's been a really long time, your cervix isn't dilating, things are not progressing. It's like, in theory, we're gonna be pregnant forever and ideally you're not pregnant forever and then the longer you're pregnant now, you're in the hospital, let's move our way towards delivery. That can help. Or it might just be a convenience thing where your doctor's maybe going to bed for the night. They're like, hey, let's get this show on the road. I wanna be home by dinner time or something. And in that case, you may be more inclined to say, no, I wanna, I wanna wait. Or is it too early? The other thing, that is the one thing actually I will say, is that the earlier the water's broken, the more risk involved related to the risks for your water breaking. So say you're one centimeter, that's less ideal than a six, seven, eight centimeter. So really six and beyond because it can lead to malposition of the baby. It has a higher risk for infection and it potentially is less effective. So flex and flow on that one. Um, but my quick answer would be, it's not okay when you don't consent to it and you don't understand why it's being recommended and you don't agree to it in that circumstance. T-Bird Camp says, if supply, breast milk supply, was low for the first baby who didn't eat well, could I have a normal supply for the next baby? My answer to this is overwhelmingly yes. So unless you were identified with like a galactosemia or some sort of like you had a history of a breast reduction, which can affect your milk supply, not always, but it can um, in general, new baby, new circumstance, new different breast tissue, different experience, different latch, different mouth, same nipple, um, that all of those contributing factors can help to influence your milk supply and new story, new baby shouldn't make necessarily a difference. This also comes from Brit Hutch 12, which I love this question. She says, advice on best IUD after birth while breastfeeding. So an IUD is an intrauterine device. It's birth control. So it's either hormonal, there's actually a non-hormonal birth control where you have this little T 
thing that's like a, a like line and then a line. So it goes like this. I suppose I'm like trying to make a T with my fingers. So it's this shape that goes inside the uterus and sticks there. It's probably like that big, so super tiny, goes inside the uterus and then that helps prevent pregnancy for a form of birth control. There are two types of IUDs. There's a hormonal type and then there's the non-hormonal type. And when you're talking birth control after you've had a baby into the breastfeeding period or the postpartum period, you want to look for birth control that is progesterone only if you have some sort of hormonal birth control or the copper IUD. So if we go now narrow, narrow down to IUDs, there's the Mirena or the Skyla that are progesterone only IUDs. Those are fine for breastfeeding and then there's the copper IUD, which doesn't have hormones, but it would, it just causes a chemical change in the uterus that prevents pregnancy. So any of those would be safe for breastfeeding. You can talk to your OB about it, talk to them about which would be the best for you based on your own history, but there are definitely IUD options while you're breastfeeding because as we know, you can technically get pregnant while you're breastfeeding. Although it can help prevent ovulation, it's not 100%. So if you're trying to avoid having another baby, then an IUD is a great option for you. Chelsea Renee said, can I refuse my newborn being taken out of the room at all? I want him with me at all times. Of course you do, right? So in general, the recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics is that the baby rooms in with you, meaning he or she stays in the room with you for the entire postpartum course. Depending on your hospital policy, they may have a nursery, they may plan to take your baby out, but you're the parent, you're in control. If you haven't seen my rights of a patient video, which I can link down below, that one is so incredibly important. To me, it's the most important message I think I probably have for you other than flex and flow, and flex and flow is more of like a life skill, whereas the patient rights one is like a hospital skill. And so know your rights and know that if they wanna take your baby out of the room, you can always ask, hey, I prefer for you to do it at the bedside. Bath, newborn procedures, the one thing I will say is just like a side note, if you're planning to circumcise your baby, that a lot of times there's like a sterile procedure room that they like to take baby to. So any kind of sterile procedure, and by sterile I mean it needs to be super duper clean so there's less of a risk of infection. Sometimes they'll take the baby out of the room for that, plus it is not super fun to watch your baby be circumcised. It might be really interesting to you, but it's not the most fun for most parents. And so that might be the one circumstance where they may recommend slash say, no, it's just not something that we do to do it at the bedside. But otherwise, of course, you're the parent, you're in control, and you can make that decision and tell them what's important to you as far as baby staying with you in the room. And then last but not least, Rachel Olma says, educate us on anemia during pregnancy, risks, symptoms, treatments. All right, so super quick spiel. Anemia during pregnancy just means that you have a low hemoglobin and hematocrit. That's going to measure your red blood cell capacity in your body. So red blood cells carry oxygen to the tissues. So if you have low of those numbers, first of all, you're probably going to feel tired, which is no fun for pregnancy. So that's really a big risk where you just feel tired, lightheaded, kind of lethargic. The other thing is we need our hemoglobin and hematocrit to be able to have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen to the tissues. Issues. So there comes a point where if those numbers get low enough, you may actually be needing a blood transfusion to give you more red blood cells to keep you to a place where you can bring those oxygen to your tissues. And by tissues, I also mean you're supplying a fetus, right? So you're growing a human being and that they need those red blood cells as well to be able to grow and perfuse slash bring those blood cells to the baby. So you may be looking at a blood transfusion if the numbers were low enough. Now, in the meantime, if you are diagnosed with anemia during pregnancy. This is an extremely common thing in pregnancy. So no stress. What they're probably going to do is put you on an iron supplement and iron helps build up your red blood cell stores. You can increase your iron in your diet. Red meats are good for that. Green leafy vegetables are good for that. And so if you are diagnosed, just know I'm going to be extra careful to add some iron to my diet. They may, you may take iron on the side and that helps to hopefully maintain or even sometimes build your stores. Again, if they still keep tracking them and they go down and down and down, it could look at a blood transfusion or other like IV medications to kind of help with the anemia. The other thing is you wanna pay attention to your symptoms. If you're feeling so tired and so weak and so lethargic and pale, you're like, I feel awful, that is absolutely something to report 
report to your doctor because the nurse in me is thinking, I hope we don't have an active bleed happening somewhere, right? But if we don't, it can also just be somewhat normal for pregnancy, but we'd rather you be treated to make sure that you're nice and healthy through the pregnancy. As far as impact on birth, I also, again, we filmed today for mentorship, this, this hemorrhage module, that if you come in with those numbers being on the low side, we also are somewhat aware that you have a little bit less reserve to bleed after you give birth. So if you were to, you're gonna bleed, right? It's normal to have a heavy like period afterwards but if you bleed a little bit more than normal or you continue bleeding that you may require more medications potential blood transfusion other kind of treatment because you may become symptomatic a little bit quicker than you would otherwise if you started out with higher levels right there's less reserve there's kind of like this like concern period and if you start here you got a lot more time to get to concern versus if you start out here you got a little bit more time but that's something your care team's going to be aware of they're going to have on their radar and then they're going to treat you accordingly and that's why you're giving birth with a care team that's so phenomenal taking the best care of you and being able to provide you with all of the resources that you need to be safe throughout your whole pregnancy labor birth and postpartum Thanks everyone for being with me here today. If you want more from me, check out the description box down below because I have all of my links down there. I have online childbirth classes, coping with labor class, which is my favorite class. There's an infant safety and CPR class that you can do from home anytime you want. Lifetime access if you want to educate yourself to be more and more confident for your upcoming labor, birth, postpartum baby. Make sure you follow me on Instagram. Make sure you subscribe down below so you never miss the future video. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye. Five tips you need to know for post, bleh, for postpartum. Hello, who am I looking at? Ah, sorry. <clears throat> wow. <sighs> okay. We're getting there, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> okay, I'll try again. Okay, wow. Well. All right. <laughs> Make sure you <clears throat> stick around. Truly hyperventilating, you're getting light, light hat. <coughs> oh my god, I have a tickle. If you haven't seen my three tips for breathing, three. <laughs> All right, well, that was fun. Do I get to take a nap now? So much caffeine, I feel it in my body. Ooh, wow, wow, wow. I'm gonna turn that thing off.